It's good to um, be back in the pulpit. Uh, a few weeks ago, I had a minor surgery, and so Brenda came in and killed it on Mother's Day, and um, then we had a great uh, missionary, um, kind of old-style preacher, wasn't that fun? And he did a great job, um, and a family friend came, and now you're stuck with me again. And, um, but I want to continue a sermon that I preached a few weeks before. And uh, remember, the sermon was on temperance. And really what we were getting at is that many of us struggle with our sinful nature. Uh, how many of you wake up always wanting to do what God wants you to do? Uh, the problem is, is that we may want to, but man, our flesh wants to do things opposite of what God wants us to do and to live. And so we struggle so much. And I, I want to help us to understand that God has given us his spirit to help us. And it, it's not to harm us, but it's to help us to have the power to live the life that God created for us to enjoy, to live that abundant life where we get to experience all that God intended for us in this life. Wouldn't you like that life? That no matter what the circumstances around us, God, into his Holy Spirit can help us to live in abundance and peace and have the life that God created us for. And so we've been talking about temperance, and we talked about that temperance really means is to uh, put into restraint or to uh, restrain this power that wants to come from us, this sinfulness. It needs to be restrained, and God has given us his Holy Spirit so that we could be free from both sin and death, but also his spirit that we could put to death the misdeeds of the body. Isn't that kind of cool? Uh, but many of us, we don't restrain our flesh via the spirit, but rather by the way we live, we restrain the spirit so that our flesh can do what it wants to do. How many of you would agree that sometimes we do that? Are you with me? And so Paul tells us that not only do we have the spirit in us, but he commands us to walk in the Spirit. And he says we also have to keep step with the Spirit. And so what does that mean? And you've all seen the military parades, right? Where they're all marching and it's left, right, left, right. And there's always somebody that's left, right, right, left, left. And when you don't keep in step and you're part of that team, your misstep can cause other people to mess up. And when the staff sergeant, who's responsible for you to walk in time, sees that you're not doing that, uh, it will often bring uh, a sense of punishment to everybody, right? A little extra miles to, uh, that you're running today, or it may be a lot of extra push-ups. Uh, and that's really not God's plan is to somehow uh, to, to punish you for it but rather he's calling us to walk in step with the Spirit so that we can experience all that God has for us. It's important that we understand that today's sermon isn't just for you personally, but it's for us corporately. It's to help us to learn how to walk in step with the Spirit so that we have less interaction with living according to the flesh and more freedom to live the life that God created for us, the life of blessing, the life of love, the life of peace. And so we're going to look at another letter that Paul wrote. That letter with temperance was taught, was taught to us uh, in his letter to the churches in Galatia, a province of Rome. But now we're going to look uh, at a letter that he wrote to the church in Rome. And in both places, uh, they, they had heavy Roman influence and culture. Uh, there were a lot of uh, temples that were there. There were a lot of, of ways to worship idols. There was, it was a very hedonistic population. In fact, it, was, it would more than rival how hedonistic our, our culture is today. It was a very difficult time to be a Christian. And the Romans... Uh, uh, were struggling with the gospel because they didn't really like the Jewish people. And now here is coming from the Jews a gospel of salvation for the Gentiles, and they're struggling with these two cultures. 
and they're struggling with the influences of the world around them. And Paul is trying to help them to understand that in Christ, there is no Jew or Gentile. There is no uh, slave or free person. There, there is just simply those that belong to Christ. And those that belong to Christ, there are certain characteristics And he's been preaching to them and helping them to understand that all of us have sinned, you know, both Jew and Gentile have sinned, and we know that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious ideal. And now he's getting to chapter 8, and he's going to show us how that we can be free from all of the condemnation that sin brings in our life, and how we can walk in a freedom uh, and, and life in the Spirit that allows us that are in Christ to be successful at our Christian walk. The same sermons that he needed to preach uh, to the Romans and the Galatians uh, and to the Philippians and to all of the different letters and places where he ministered and wrote letters to, Paul understood that even as Christians, if we don't live by the Spirit, we won't live in the blessing of God. And if we live completely in our flesh, we'll actually live in the condemnation that the world is experiencing today. How many of you want to live in blessing rather than condemnation? So let's take a look today. And the good news is I've taken this sermon and cut it in half, so it won't be quite as long. And so what that means is next week you get part two. Are you with me? So the the title of today's sermon is, is live by the Spirit or live in the Spirit. Romans chapter 1 or chapter 8 verse 1 says this, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Can I get an amen? Now, verse 3 is a little hard to understand, and I'm going to paraphrase it for you in just a few minutes. But follow along with me the best you can. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Verse 5, for those, who li- who are, for those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Now I want you to notice he's making a distinction. It is people who live by the flesh and people who live by the Spirit. He's making a distinction between whom freedom has come and whom condemnation has been removed. In verse 7, it says, Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. How many realize that we don't want to be in the flesh from this so far? This is an IQ test. (laughs) Verse 9, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Wow. Isn't that what you want to know? But here's the condition. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. We're talking about being resurrected. Verse 12. So then, brethren, we are under obligation. I want you to notice that. We are obliged to live a certain way. We have an obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. If you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds or misdeeds of the body, 
you will live. I'm going to stop here, although we're going to continue on this thought. Uh, You can notice in verse 14 that those who live according to the Spirit are sons of God. And so there is this sense that there are two separate groups. There are those that live by the flesh, and there are those who live by the Spirit. And so the question is, is how do we uh, live by the Spirit and then experience no condemnation? Don't you want to know that? How do we live by the Spirit so that we can experience no uh, condemnation? Because we know that if we live by the flesh, that we're still, we still live under the condemnation. But God has called us to live by the Spirit. There are six things that we're going to look at that help us to understand how we can know that the Spirit of God is in us and how we can be set free and how we can pursue the life that God created you to live. We're only going to talk about three today, and we'll conclude with, the ne- with three more next week. But the first of these is that we must be in Christ Jesus. We have to uh, become a Christian, not in name, uh, but in reality, where we experience the grief of the, and the weight of the condemnation that's upon us and we realize that we have sinned against God, and we call out to Jesus and ask for forgiveness, that we need to be uh, born again, we need to be transformed, we need to be renewed, and that we recognize that we're in need of a Savior. And so we call upon the name of the Lord, and the Bible says all who call upon the name of the Lord in this sincerity and with this, this sorrow for the way that we've lived, all that call upon his name will be saved. And being saved means that we then come under his covering, that we are in Christ because he is covering us with his righteousness and his blood. Just as the blood was sprinkled, as we learn today in communion, above the doorpost, the blood of Jesus is applied to us. And so when the death angel comes, we are saved. Amen? Amen. That we have an inheritance with Christ. We, We must remain in Christ. We must live our life under that covering. It says that we must not only be in Christ Jesus, but he defines those who are in Christ. It's not just raising a hand. It's not just crying some tears, but it's accepting the lifestyle that Christ will be the Lord over your life and that his spirit that he's placed in us will now be in control of our life, leading us into all truth. It says in verse 4 that those who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. The distinction is is that we must be in Christ, and the assumption is that if we're in Christ, transformation is taking place by the Spirit of God so that we now live according to the Spirit and not according to our flesh. If you're with me, say amen. Amen. So verse 3, between verse 1 and 4, verse 3 really gives us uh, an understanding why we need Christ in this process. And I paraphrased it, hopefully, to help you better understand what Paul is saying. First, he says, uh, the first part is God gave us the law as a way to live righteously before him. But we could not follow it because the desire for our ways controlled us. And so we see the type in the Old Testament uh, of, of the animal sacrifice, right? Right? And we see that that blood, was, you would go and you would put your hand upon the animal and they would sacrifice the animal because there would be a transference of your sin to the animal and you would be forgiven and you were be, to be asked to live according to the law. And so you would go out and then you would begin to uh, live your life and you would sin again and you would have to go again and place your hand upon the animal so that you could be forgiven of your sin. But there was a caveat to that, that if you intentionally chose to sin, that sacrifice wouldn't do it. You were in deep weeds. 
How many of you have known that it's contrary to God's law and yet you've still done it? In the Old Testament, there wasn't forgiveness for that. How many of you would be in deep weeds? I got both of my hands up. (laughs) And so because of our desire to do what we want to do, the, the sacrificial system that God provided was not adequate for our propensity and even our intensity to do the wrong thing. Most of us sin not because we simply made a mistake, because we planned it out and chosen to sin. The good news is that when Christ came, he, had, he was a superior, superior sacrifice. And not only did, was he able to forgive us of all sins, intentional and non-intentional sins, meaning that we sinned and we didn't know we sinned, but he was able even to clear our conscience of it, to know that God, if we're in Christ, we are totally set free from all of our sin. And the cool thing, it's past, present, which is today, and future. Meaning that what Jesus did was so remarkable that he was able to forgive your sins for all time in all aspects of your life, past, present, and future. Isn't that cool? And so we get to live in grace. And Galatians 5.1 says it was for freedom that Christ freed us. In other words, we're freed so we can be free. (laughs) Isn't that kind of cool? And then he says, but some of you, though you're freed to be freed, you still are walking according to the old ways. And that God didn't free you for that. He freed you for a new experience in life, a new power, a new authority, a new way to overcome. In fact, he says that we're more than conquerors. Why? Because Jesus overcame the world. He overcame all of our issues. And he did so, it says, so God sent his son to clothe him in flesh. He became like us in every way so that he could experience the temptations that we experience. He could be hangry because he had a human stomach. He had the the temptation to to, to fight and to, to curse and to do the wrong thing. All of those things, he felt that temptation. But the unique thing about Jesus is that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was not born with our nature of sinfulness. And because of his con- being conceived by the Holy Spirit, unlike Adam, who was also breathed into by God and given life, Jesus, as the second Adam, he didn't sin. He did everything that the Father asked him to do. And so he is the only one who was man who didn't sin. And because of that uniqueness of who he was, he was the only one qualified to take the punishment from Adam on of death and, re- and actually bring forgiveness or appeasement for, from God and the condemnation of God and give us blessing. Wow. You say there are many ways to God. No, there's not. There's only one who came from heaven and put on flesh. There's only one that was tempted in every way that we're tempted, yet did not sin. There's only one who was worthy to give his life on the cross of Calvary as the punishment of our sin so that we could have forgiveness. And I'm here to tell you in the future, there's only going to be one found in heaven or on earth that is willing to put an end to Satan's reign and is coming soon to gather those that are in Christ to be with him forever and ever. There's only one, and his name is Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one goes to the Father except through him. 
You can't get to heaven without coming and submitting your life under the authority and the covering of the grace and mercy offered through Jesus Christ. He's the only one. It says that God sent his son and to clothe him in flesh. So he would both live according to the law, he fulfilled the law, he did not give in to temptation, and he satisfied the punishment required by the law for sin. The wages of sin is death with his own flesh, being crucified on the cross. And now we see what verse 4 means. For those who now live according to the Spirit, those who have experienced the covering of Christ, was this freedom from condemnation accomplished. You must first be in Christ if you want to be free from condemnation. There is no other step. You can't skip this step and go to step number two. This step is the basic requirement. You must ask Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life, and that means that he has authority to speak into your life by his spirit to lead you towards abundance and away from death. Secondly, we see that we must set our minds on the spirit. Let's take a look at verse six. In verse six, it says, for the mind set on the flesh is death, But the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. We must set our minds on what the Spirit wants. Just like we must temper the flesh and give um, freedom to the Spirit to do the work in our life, so we must set our minds on the right thing. Because as a man thinks, so is he. If all you think about is your life, your desires, your wants, your needs, then you're going to follow after the flesh. But if you have a mind set on the spirit that wants to be pleasing to God, who wants in gratitude for all that God's done for you, to to be a blessing to others, to uh, put first the kingdom of God, all of those things that come and bring blessing to your life, then you have to set your mind on the spirit. And Paul says, if you live by the flesh, uh, you will live by the flesh because your mind is set on the things of the flesh. And you will live by the Spirit because your mind is set on the Spirit. You have to choose how you're going to focus your thoughts. The Bible says we have to take every thought captive. And that doesn't mean every bad thought. It means that we have to be captivated by the love of Christ such that our mind and our focus is upon him and his plan and purpose and not be captivated by the world and what it says we should live and be like. If we look at what Paul says about the mind set on the flesh, it says that the mind set on the flesh is first of all produces death. The wages of sin is death. The mind set on the flesh is both is hostile to, toward God. It means that the things, if your mind is set on your flesh, you'll find that Scripture conflicts a lot of times with what you'd like to do. When somebody cuts me off in traffic, my flesh wants to smack them, and I may spiritualize it and say, in the name of Jesus, <laughs> but my flesh cries out. Does your flesh cry out? Uh, I found that as I've gotten older, when I accidentally cut, see, when I do it, it's an accident, but when they do it, it's on purpose, uh, that my gray hair gives me more grace. They're like, oh, he's old, so I don't have to. But, but really, there are things that, you know, that somebody spits on you, boy, your flesh is going to want to cry out. Are you with me? Let somebody say something bad about your child. Oh, dear Jesus. It's not the Holy Spirit that speaks after that. You might be able to say that about your child, but nobody else can. That's right. 
That's my wife. I'm the only one that's able to talk bad about her. You know what I mean? <laughs> there are lots of things that our flesh wants to jump in, and it wants to cry out. And if our mind isn't set on God, our flesh will be hostile to what God wants, to turn the other cheek. Wow, my flesh doesn't want to turn the other cheek. I want to respond in kind. That when people curse me, my flesh wants to curse them, but the Spirit of God says bless them. When somebody wrongs me, I want to wrong them back, but the Spirit says uh, don't, don't wrong them, but rather pray for those who persecute you. Dear Jesus, my flesh is hostile to the things of God. But if my mind is set on the Spirit, I have a chance. Are you with me? It says the mind set on the flesh does not subject itself to the law of God, for it's not even able to do so. Without Jesus and giving us His Holy Spirit, then no matter how we construct our lives, our motivations are always going to be wrong. We can't live by godly motivations when our only motivation is our own personal flesh. So we can't please God. And that's what the fourth one says. The mind set on the flesh can't please God. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? If your mind that's set on the flesh produces death, and if your mind uh, set on the flesh is hostile to God, and if your mind set on flesh keeps you from living God's way, then it makes sense that you can't please God because God loves you and he wants to create an environment for you where you can prosper and grow and you can become everything that God has placed in you. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, God knew you and he gave you gifts and he gave you talents and he gave you the capacity to do certain things and God wants to see all that he created, all of that potential that he placed in you uh, in conception come to reality and so when you're living a way that's different from what God wants from you what was really happening is God's not pleased because he had so much more in store for you than you're currently living it's God's good pleasure to bless his children and he simply is frustrated because you won't set your mind on the things that will bring blessing to your life. Wow. It got quiet. But we have the Spirit of God in us, amen? amen. The mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. Not only life in this life, the sense of joy and peace of knowing the Lord, but life eternal that we have peace with God. It doesn't matter if I die today, I know that I'm at peace with God. It is well with my soul. I'm at peace because I know that even though I'm not perfect, that I'm living a life to be pleasing to the Father. And in living that life, there is joy and there is peace. And it is it's like a river flowing through me. Because I know I have peace because my mind is set upon the Lord. Now, I don't live perfectly according to that. My flesh still is speaking. Yak, 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 all through the day. But if I keep my mind focused on, on the Spirit, if I keep my mind on Christ, if I keep my eyes focused on the one who saved me and redeemed me and has set me free, if I put my focus on the one who has, is for me and not against me, why would I put my attention on the flesh when I know that there is an enemy of my soul that is against me and wants to harm me? The mindset on the Spirit is acceptance. We're sons of God. We're totally accepted by God. Hear me tell you this. The person that's in Christ, I want to tell you this, because Christ is in you and His Spirit dwells in you, you are enough. You're the apple of God's eye. 
When he looks at you, he sees not only your potential, but he sees the power of his spirit in you that is making a change in the world around you. Wow. You're accepted. And he says, I'm not only giving you a little power, but I'm giving you resurrection power. That if the Spirit of Christ lives in you, when it comes that time of Christ coming back and calling His church, He says the dead in Christ will rise first. And those of us who are alive and remain, that same Spirit that's in us is the key to ascending into heaven and to being with Jesus forever and ever. There is a power of eternity that lives within you. You are not a temporal being, but you are an eternal being. And you're not facing eternal condemnation because of Jesus. You're accept, you're, you've been accepted as sons, and you will live as heirs of Christ, and you will experience the joy of a pleasure of God over your life for all eternity. We see that the mindset on the Spirit puts to death the deeds of the body the misdeeds of the body and that leads me to the third and final one we're going to look at today for those who are who live by the spirit and experience no condemnation they are a people who are constantly putting to death the misdeeds of the body Let's take a look at verses 12 and 13. In verse 12 it says, So then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if if by the Spirit... How do we put to death the misdeeds of the body? By the Spirit. Um, Then you will live. And so there's this process for us that we must go through. We we have to put to to death the, the misdeeds of the body. These things that are continually a problem. Uh, I can preach this great message today. It's not my message, it's his message, right? But I can then go out and with my body have misdeeds. Are you with me? The reason we have to continually put to death the misdeeds of the body is because we're not yet perfect. You see, when Christ comes, we will be separated from our sinful nature. Isn't that kind of cool? And so it says we're yearning for the day when we'll be separated from all the things that get us into trouble, all the desires that take us away from God's plan and purpose, all the things that bring hurt and harm to other people, all the things that dishonor God, all of those, uh, all of those desires are going to be severed from us when Christ returns. Until then, though, he gives us his spirit to help us to say no to those things because they're still speaking into our life. But the Spirit of God is greater than our sinful desire. He can help you overcome. There's a day coming either by death or by the rapture that we'll ascend into heaven and the old nature goes away. And the cool thing is this old body gets transformed too. I'll be able to eat at the marriage supper of the Lamb and not worry about the calories. <laughs> Are you with me? There's going to be a body that's immortal. It's not the things that are mortal, the things that, that require me to have to sleep and have to... Wouldn't, don't you feel like you could get so much more done if you never had to rest? <laughs> if you're not a type A personality, that made no sense to you. But if you're like me, a type A man, you just want to go, 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 go. And sleep is just a hindrance. I don't like to waste time when I go to bed. When my head hits a pillow, I need to be out because that's a waste of time to sit there and just think about stuff. Some of you, you spend half the night just thinking about stuff. You might as well have been up doing something. I want to get to sleep and I want to wake up crisp and I want to get to it. 
Anybody else out there? That's how I want to live. But there's a day coming where I won't need to sleep because I'll be in rest eternal with God. That I'll have peace that passes all understanding. I'm not going to have to worry about problem solving this and problem solving that. I'm not going to be drawn away from the things that help me. And I'm just going to live in the blessing of God. You see, we have to put to death the misdeeds of the body while we're here, though. So what are those? And if we go back to Galatians 5, I'm going to end with this. Paul tells us the things that are of the flesh that will keep us from living free and living alive in Christ. In verse 19 of chapter 5, it says, Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, and sensuality. Now these three are grouped together, and I'm not sure why orgies is way down the line. But I I can help you to understand what Paul's saying here. In the culture of worship of these idols was a lot of sexual immorality. In fact, the temples would have young children that served as prostitutes, both boys and girls. The, they would have these temples where the way you would worship is that you would go and you would use your body or you would pay for a prostitute and that would provide for the temple and provide for these other things. And it was so pervasive in the culture that every form of debauchery to where they would include the word orgy in the Bible as if that's a common thing, but it was a common practice of worship to idols. The sensuality of presenting yourself as as if you might be uh, available for such activity. All of those things, Paul says that if you do these things or live this way, Now, they didn't have pornography back then. They just had lots of art and lots of depiction of debauchery. Statues everywhere. But now we can sit in our own um, houses and we can bring all of the world's debauchery into our own home. We We can feed our flesh every fetish known to man with with a simple iPhone. So Paul is saying to us that the problem they had then is a problem we have now and that living according to the flesh will lead you down this dark path to where these things will take control of your life and they'll keep you from living the Spirit-led life. Paul wrote these, this uh, description Uh, to more than one church, but he writes it to Galatians that are Christians because some of them are struggling with this. Are are you following? Did you know Christians can do the wrong things? Come on now. I don't know your life. I don't know the details of what you do, but life by the Spirit doesn't do those things. And I know some of you are so gripped by your flesh that it's going to take something supernatural to break that in your life. But I've got good news for you. The blood of Jesus breaks every bond. The Spirit of God delivers from every sin. There is power in the name of Jesus as you speak that over that sin in your life. As you speak the name of Jesus, you can be free from the things that keep you bound because the Son sets you to be free so that you could be free indeed. He wants you to be able to let go and pursue those things. He talks about our sexual desires. He talks about idolatry, which we talked about. There's also sorcery, dealing and dabbling in the occult, worshiping demons. There's enmity and strife and jealousy and fits of anger. That doesn't relate to me wanting to smack somebody in this, this 
I, I forgot that part was in here. <clears throat> but it says fits of anger, rivalries. I can't say that very well. Dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness. Listen to me, church. If you're led by the Spirit, we're not to be drunk with wine, but we're to be filled with the Spirit of God. As believers, there's no room for us to be drunk. If I didn't hear an amen. Can you at least say, oh me? Orgies and things like these. In other words, this isn't the whole list. But look what he says. I warn you as I warned you before. He's speaking to Christians. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Turn with me to the last page of your Bible. In Revelations chapter 22, verse 15. Let's start with 14. Let me read this to you. There's not a slide for this, so uh, if you have your phone, you can turn there, or if you're following along um, with your Bible, you can read it here. It says, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. In other words, that they're allowed in. It says in verse 15, though, outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and the murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. So what does this verse mean? It means this. Although there are lots of people who were heathens, who were dogs, uh, in this life, they came to Christ and they'll be in heaven. Are you with me? There are many people who uh, were dabbling in the occult. Even in Scripture, we see sorcerers that repent and come to know Jesus. They'll be in heaven. There are those that are sexually immoral that will be in heaven that, and, and that have repented will be in heaven. There are murderers. Even Moses was a murderer, right? I think Moses will be in heaven. There are idolaters, those who worship the idols or worship their own self. And those are, are, are those who have practiced falsehood. How many of you think that will be in heaven that once told a lie? Heaven will be filled of people who were liars. Are, are, are you with me? So what does this mean? It means those who go to heaven are going to be those who uh, have practiced verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes, who put to death the misdeeds of the body. What do we wash our robes in? Scripture. We read His Word. We, we listen to the Spirit of God as He speaks into our life. As we pursue Him in every way, we walk in the Spirit and we also uh, stay, keep in step with the Spirit. Because that's the only way that we are allowed into heaven. Here's what I want you to hear. If you are a Christian and you continue to practice these things, if you continue to listen to the flesh, it will lead you away from the entrance of the gates. You cannot have habitual sin in your life by the Spirit if you want to be free of condemnation you will put to death the misdeeds of the body wow this isn't my words this is God's word this is one of the last things that God wants you to understand is you can't live however you want according to your flesh and on that day say, well, I raised my hand once in church and I prayed a sinner's prayer, but the Spirit of God never took root in my life. I, I tempered the Spirit because I didn't want to be weird. 
I, I tempered the spirit because I wanted to be accepted by man more than God. I, I tempered the spirit because uh, there were just things I wanted to do and I know he would say no to. I tempered the spirit because there were things he wanted me to do that I just didn't want to ever do. And Paul says, I warn you. And I warn you again. If you continue to live by the flesh, the fruit of the flesh is death. But if you live by the Spirit, it's life and peace forever. Let's pray. And Father, I come to you today. And God, we're so grateful for your Holy Spirit. Your Spirit that leads us and guides us into all truth. A Spirit who loves us and wants the very best for us. The Spirit that beckons us and calls us to pursue the things of God. To live a life pleasing to God. To let go of the things that harm us and harm others and dishonor God. And take hold of the things that allow us to be a blessing to others, to live in the authority of your word and that resurrection power. And God, you knew we wouldn't be perfect, and so you gave us your spirit. But God, you also, uh, to help us through those times, but God, you never intended for us to be free so that we can continue to live in slavery. You never set us free so that we could make a choice uh, for you or for our flesh and always choose our flesh. But God, you set us free for freedom. And that freedom only comes as we live in step with your Spirit, as we walk with the Spirit, as we're filled with the Spirit, as we're empowered by the Spirit. And so God, help us to set our minds on the Spirit, not on the flesh. And Jesus, I ask that you would forgive us of our sins. God, that you would wash us and make us clean through the blood of Jesus Christ that was applied to us. God, I pray, Lord, that you would give us the mind of Christ through your Holy Spirit. Lord, that we might think what you would have us think, that we might pursue whatever you place before us, that we might walk in the liberty and the freedom of living for you, being pleasing and holy and acceptable to you, O oh God. That we might take hold of the very things you took hold of us for, that we might live as sons and daughters of the Most High, that we might reign with Christ. So God, I, I pray that you would help us with this revelation from your word today. Lord, to cast our eyes upon the things of God, to seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, to pursue you with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. Lord, to long for your appearing, to long for your coming, but yet be found faithful doing the things you've called us to do, both individually and as a church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.